Hello everyone. Good to be here today again. Happy to be with you. Let me just turn up this and we go straight into the business for the day. You're welcome again to Rich Flood webinar. This is uh, module nine on our series for environmental and social assessment webinars. And uh, today we are focusing on uh, environmental and social assessment and management systems. So I have my side with us here. This is a continuation. Um, this is a continuation of series of modules covering the IFC performance standards one. The clients, you know, in coordination with other responsible government agencies and third parties as appropriate. Uh, that is, those parties legally obligated and responsible for assessing and managing specific uh, risks and uh, impacts like government led resettlement, you know, will conduct a process of uh, environmental and social assessment and establish and maintain an ESMS appropriate to the nature and scale of the project and also commensurate with the level of its environmental and social risks and uh, impacts. So my name is Comfort Asokoro Ogaji. I work for Rich Flood LLC in the US and uh, Rich Flood International Limited in Africa, precisely in Nigeria. So uh, these, uh, uh, the IFC performance standards uh, on environmental and social sustainability effective uh, January 1st, 2012, is the document that uh, I am using for this webinar. So I'm happy that you are here. I hope that we have a nice time the next few minutes and uh, I hope that you learn one or two things and maybe share your thoughts with us. You can please drop down your comments or questions. We can discuss your project in the process if there is time. And uh, please subscribe to our channel subscribe to our channels, our social media channels, so that we can always bring you this uh, information as appropriate and uh, timelessly. Okay, so today we will, the overview I have here is uh, on, uh, we are going to take on the, the ESMS, which will, of course, incorporate the following elements, policy, identification of risks and impact, management programs, organizational capacity and competence, uh, emergency preparedness and so on and so forth. So, but uh, these have been section models. Today, I will just take on uh, the policy. I'll take on number two, the module nine is what we're taking today. So you can see uh, which modules are module nine. For stakeholder engagement, it was module eight. I hope you were part of us when we took stakeholder engagement. And then in the future, we'll be looking at module 10, which is the management programs and also module 11 which has to do with uh, emergency preparedness and response and also monitoring and review of, uh, of uh, uh, environmental issues as will be identified. Okay, so let's move forward on. So uh, for the ESMS policy we're covering in this module, as you can see, the clients will establish uh, an overarching policy defining the environmental and social objectives, you know, the clients will provide a framework and uh, also the principles that guide the project to achieve sound environmental and social performance. So uh, the policy provides a framework for the environmental and social assessment and management process and specifies that the project or the business activity or as appropriate any, any uh, activity as may be deemed fit has to comply with the applicable laws and regulations of the jurisdiction in which it has been undertaken including, of course, those laws implementing uh, host country obligations under international law. So uh, basically, the ESMS policy should be consistent with the principles of the performance standards. You know, under some circumstances, clients may also subscribe to other, other internationally uh, recognized standards, you know, as you go on on the project or certification schemes or codes of practice. And these two should be included in the policy, in the ESMS policy. So the policy will indicate who within the organization will ensure conformance with the policy and be responsible for its uh, um, uh, its, uh, its execution. You know, so the clients will communicate the policy to all level of its organization. That is uh, the communication. So 
uh, identification of risks, which we are still co covering in this uh, module today, uh, the clients has to establish, or the investment project, or the organization has to establish and maintain a process for identifying the environmental and social risks and impacts of that particular project. Okay, so the type, the scale, the location of project will guide the scope and level of effort devoted to the risk and impact identification process. So the scope of the risk and impact identification process will be consistent with a good international industry practice, you know, and will determine the appropriate uh, relevant methods and assessment tools to be used. So the process may consist of, um, the process may, com may comprise a full-scale uh, environmental and social impact assessment, that's Asia, like you can see on the point there, it may compri comprise the full Asia or a limited or focused environmental and social assessment or a straightforward application of environmental sites in pollution standards, design criteria or construction standards, as the case may be. So for greenfield uh, uh, developments or large expansions, because you, you, you may have some projects that are greenfield, some may be existing, not completely new. And uh, when they are large expansions, we, we kind of categorize them as though they are also greenfield projects, okay? So for greenfield projects or large expansions uh, projects with specifically identified fiscal elements or aspects uh, and to generate potential uh, significant uh, environmental or even social impact, the, the investment, the project or the client will have to conduct a comprehensive Asia, including an examination of alternatives. Asia is environmental and social impact assessment, including alternatives that uh, may be considered in the process when they're appropriate. So when the project involves assets, like I said earlier, Environmental and or social audits are supposed to be conducted or risk or hazard assessments uh, may be appropriate and sufficient to identify risk and impact for the project. So if assets to be developed, acquired or financed have yet to be defined, the establishment of an environmental and social due diligence process will identify risk and impacts you know, ahead of time. At a point in the future when the fiscal element assets and facilities are reasonable, reasonably understood, okay? So the risks and impacts identification process will be based on recent environmental and social baseline at an appropriate level of detail. So the baseline data will really be relevant at the point. So the process will also consider all relevant environmental of the project, including the issues identified in a performance standards to through to eight, from two to eight, you know, all of these will have to be considered in the, in the process and also are likely to be affected by such risks and impacts. You know, I mentioned that we have captured the stakeholder engagement. So those people who are likely to be affected will have to be considered also in the process, okay? So in limited high risk uh, circumstances, it may be appropriate for the client to complement its environmental and social risks or impact identification process with a specific human rights due diligence as, you know, as relevant to the particular business. So the risks and impact identification process will consider the emissions of greenhouse gas, the rele relevant uh, risks associated with the changing climate and the adaptation opportunities and potential transport effects such as pollution of air, or use or pollution of international waterways, depending on the nature of the project and the location of the project as well. So where the project involves a specifically identified fiscal elements or aspects and uh, facilities that are likely to generate impacts, environmental and social risks and impacts will be identified in the context of the project's area of influence. I would have loved to dwell more on the project area of influence, but we'll look into it maybe in a later um, in a late, later webinar we will look into project area of influence and some of those factors that uh, influences project footprint so this area of influence uh, 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 encompa encompasses a lot actually so I will just go straight to the next slide here where I have the the uh, I think I, yes 
identification of risks, yeah, projects in flood areas. I will just uh, uh, explain this briefly, and then another time we can look fully, we can have a full webinar uh, um, uh, concentrating basically on, uh, on the project area of influence, okay? So this area of influence uh, encompasses as appropriate uh, the area likely to be affected by the project. The examples include the project sites, the immediate air shade and water shade or transport corridors, and uh, the client's activities and facilities that are directly owned, operated, or managed, you know, and that are a component of the project, including by contractors as well. Okay, so examples may include power transmission corridors, pipelines, canals, tunnels, relocation and access roads, borough and proposal areas, construction, contaminated land or soil or groundwater, you know, surface water and even sediments. Okay, those, uh, if these areas are impacted, the project, uh, the, 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 I mean, the, the, it has to be captured as a project's uh, area of influence. So the area likely to be affected also by impacts from unplanned uh, but predicted development caused by the project that may occur later or at a different location uh, also. So indirect project impacts on diversity also. Uh, uh, the area is part of the area likely to be affected, you know. Um, just a moment, I'm trying to see if I can uh, affect it with associated uh, facilities now. So associated facilities uh, usually are facilities that are not funded as part of the project, in a way, <laughs> as the name implies, and that would not have been constructed or expanded if the project did not exist in the first place, and without which the project will not be viable such as railway roads, you know, if uh, uh, railway, railway lines, I mean, roads, uh, active power plants or transmission lines, if the project is not as uh, existing, uh, for instance, you will not be able to build a power plant if there are no transmission lines. Maybe like in Nigeria, you have the national grid that you have to connect to. If such facilities are not in place, then it will be a little complicated for the project to, to go on, okay? So that's uh, uh, associated facilities too will be affected. The third one I have here is cumulative impact. Okay, uh, cumulative impact that results from the incremental impact on areas or resources used or directly in project from other existing uh, planned uh, defined developments at the time the risk and impact identification process is conducted. So cumulative impacts are limited to those impacts generally recognized as important on the basis of scientific concerns, you know, or concerns from affected uh, communities, all right? So in the event of risks and impacts uh, in the project area of influence resulting from a third party action, uh, the organization or the, the project uh, implementation team will address those risks and impacts in a manner commensurate with the uh, uh, control with the organization's control and influence and influence over the uh, third parties with due regard to conflict of interest. Okay, so when the client can reasonable, reasonably uh, exercise control, the risk and impact identification process will also consider those risks and impact associated with primary supply chains as defined, of course, in the performance standards uh, two to six to be covered in the future uh, models that we are going to bring to you, okay? So where the projects involves uh, specifically identify physical impact uh, aspects, uh, facilities that are likely to generate environmental and social impact, the identification of risks will take into account the findings and conclusions of related and applicable plans or studies or assessments prepared by relevant government uh, authorities or agents or other practices that are directly related to the project. Okay, so this include, um, this are the, the uh, we've talked about uh, this, so affected due to vulnerability, um, 
where the project involves specifically identifying physical elements, aspects that are likely to generate impacts as part of the process of identifying risks. The client will identify individual groups that may be directly and differentially or disproportionately affected by the project because of their disadvantaged or vulnerable status. So this disadvantaged or vulnerable status may stem from an individual or uh, race, color, sex, language, or even religion, and so on, or other status. The, 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 the project or the organization should also consider factors such as uh, gender, you know, gender inclusion, sickness, physical or mental disability, and all that. Okay, where individuals or groups are identified as vulnerable, the, the organization uh, should propose and implement differentiated measures so that, that adverse uh, impacts do not fall disproportionately on them and they are not uh, disadvantaged in sharing development benefits, you know, and opportunities that the project may bring. All right. So uh, this is the end of my webinar today. I would be very glad to take your questions if you haven't. I would like you to look at uh, uh, what we have discussed. If there are any issues that you want us to look into or to discuss further, I'll be very willing to talk with you about it. Meanwhile, uh, thank you for joining me for this webinar. And uh, subscribe to our channel. Don't forget to subscribe to our channel. We are always happy to hear from you so that you can guide the direction of the webinar. Okay. While I'm waiting for your comments as you're typing,